Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the TFC Audio Project. In this episode of Shop Talk, Mike and I have a conversation about what we feel are essential elements in an optimal and balanced physical practice. The question is like, what is a physical practice? The benefits of having a physical practice, comparing movement and exercise, our own stories of how our training has shifted, and we break down elements like mobility work, strength training, movement exploration, and a couple of others. This episode is sponsored by TFC Balance Beams. Our new 1.4 beam is officially out and it's our most affordable beam yet. It comes in three, four, five, and six foot sizes and gives you a durable piece of equipment to refine your hip stability and help combat things like low back pain, knee pain, foot problems, which a lot of times are byproducts of having tight hips. Go to tfc-shop.com and click on the beam tab for more info on those. This episode is also sponsored by our travel partner, Nanook Protective Hard Cases, which we use to transport gear for our seminars and workshops. You can check out their awesome cases at nanook, N-A-N-U-K.com. That's it for sponsors, so let's dig into this episode. It's the TFC Audio Project. It's a collective effort. Help people understand their bodies, starting at the feet are the gateway for people to see that there's an issue. You know, a foot conversation is always a whole body conversation. Hey folks, Nick and Mike here for another episode of Shop Talk. Today what we're going to talk about is um, having a conversation about an optimal physical practice. You know, what is a physical practice? How our practices have changed over time personally? Um, the benefits of a physical practice and we finish off with what we consider to be components of an optimal physical practice so I guess maybe a good place to start is what is a physical practice like how do you how do you define that because it is fairly broad but it's broad for a reason because it allows you to encompass not just um, working out or lifting weights but all kind of realms of physicality and and, uh, having a practice that enhances both physical and mental health so how do you define physical practice yeah, so I think for me, it's turned into something way different than what it was. Um, way deeper, I would say, for me too. Yeah, so I, I mean, for me, the, I, I think at the start, I, I started working out um, for the purposes of you know looking a certain way and to help with things like hockey. Mm-hmm. So I was a hockey player at the start, so that's kind of what pushed me towards like working out. But I think at the start, I was working out in kind of a bodybuilding fashion, just trying to build muscles up. I remember that. Didn't really know school. what I was doing. <laughs> and I think I think we were both in the same category with that. Uh, just just training for the sake of you know, there's different reasons for. It. I think a lot of like high school kids or like younger people just want to like look jacked. That's honestly part of why I was doing it. Yeah, you want to have a um, you want to be able to bench press a lot of weight and have good biceps and triceps. Those are the, like the high school goals summarized. And I feel like everyone starts there, and that's just. You know, I think some of the younger kids that we're treating now are having a very different approach to training based on what we're, you know, showing them more carry, showing them more functional stuff. Um, I kind of wish we had that in high school or someone told us that in high school because but, my, my career in terms of uh, sports and rugby and injuries would have been so different. I'm sure you're the same. Exactly. But at the same time, it's still kind of the most common thing that you see. Like mm-hmm. I see high school kids coming in who are like, what do you do? Like I had a kid come in the other day and who... He literally said the only things he did were, were curls and bench press, um, and he was a he was a rugby player. I was like, okay, like we can probably talk about you know making that a little bit better. Um, so I think that it's beyond you know where it starts for people might be working out for for looks, and that's something not to not to overlook. Like, but I think that that is completely flipped on its head for me, and I think that when, once we get into more into the discussion of what it should entail, that looks are almost a byproduct of something uh of your physical practice yeah. but but there should be effect. their side effect yeah. and looking at it that way as opposed to doing it for the looks is very is i think a healthier way of, of doing it for many other reasons same thing with pain like pain is really um decreasing pain or preventing injuries is a side effect of a balanced physical practice mm-hmm. right if you go in and okay i want to treat this knee pain a lot of times you don't actually get to what's causing the knee pain but looking at the body as this integrated unit that you take objective measures of of look at functional movements and how someone's doing them you get rid of someone's knee pain by just getting them to squat with optimal mechanics Mm -hmm. so it's the same thing like you said i think the physical everyone wants to look good naked and if you discount that or shun it off as something that's not relevant you lose some people because it is a relevant aspect exactly Um, but but there's a way if you look yeah you put it well it's a side effect of a good physical practice and i think that for me i don't know do you want to expand on our physical practices at first sure going from that bodybuilding style of working out where it's like train different muscles in different areas try to get jacked um it created really this imbalanced uh body Mm -hmm. right um 
and, and it's like you're almost training yourself into dysfunction a lot of times mm-hmm. um, if you don't incorporate some of these, you know, more human movements, uh, carrying stuff, doing global compound movements like squatting, uh, hinging, picking stuff up, um, you yeah, know, running, I, all that. When we started to incorporate um, deadlifts, squats, and even loaded carries, those were like the biggest things that blew my mind initially where I was like, how the hell did I not do this? so far and we too like we were in in a a ymca which had it was probably one of the biggest powerlifting hubs in ottawa at the time um now not so much but you know the tenants underneath weren't really happy when people were dropping 400 pound bars constantly yeah (laughs) um i actually worked below the gym in the sports in the sport check and you just hear bang bang all day long It it was kind of funny but but yeah going from you know, the bodybuilding style and then that powerlifting community kind of rubbed off on us. We started to get into squats and deadlifts. Um, and that was a big game changer for me, yeah. especially in terms of just how strong. You notice it in rugby, right? You do benching and curls and then you go and start doing squats and deadlifts and you just feel like a tank when you're when you're playing a sport like hockey for you, rugby for me. Um, so you could tell functionally your whole body's stronger when you start doing these complex movements and, and it makes a huge, that was, that was a big difference maker. I think so too. So, so taking it from more of a bodybuilding style to more of a, you know, a, a functional compound movement style. Um, then the, the, I think the next transition for me was, was looking even deeper into, if we're talking just about training in a, in a gym setting, I started getting into more unilateral movements. Mm-hmm. So more rotational stuff too, right? um, as well as rotational stuff. Yeah. So I think, you know, we'll touch on that a little bit later as we go, but part of your physical practice should be learning from from the things you've done in the past and trying to achieve what you want to achieve with your body, whatever your goals are, um, in terms of what you want to do outside of your physical practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can chunk physical practice into like anything you're doing with your, with your body. Yeah. Um, like walking is part of a physical yeah, practice. Exactly. Breath and I work. think that's another thing is we I've expanded to all these other things that, that have made it more of a complete physical practice instead of just lifting heavy weights, um, in certain specific exercises every day of the week. So, um, even terminology wise, like physical practice is such a better term than, um, you know, exercise or, you know, I think movement, we talked about that in our seminar where if you compare movement and exercise, you know, Katie Bowen put it very well. She said exercise is a small little circle. Uh, and in that circle are common movements that people are doing in the gym, which are the same 15 movements, you know, mm-hmm. stairmaster, bicep curls, bench pressing, um, lunges, you know, they're the same cookie cutter movements that people are doing repetitively. They're they're very unidimensional. There's not a whole lot of rotation. There's not a whole uh, lot of unilateral work. So, you know, exercise, that small subset is part of, you know, this giant circle of movement. And humans are designed to be amazing movers in terms of the variety of things we can do. Um, you always give that analogy where you say we're the best movers on the planet. And then someone says, well, my cat can jump six feet in the air. And it's like, really? Can your cat throw a javelin? Can your cat throw a, a shot put or do a loaded carry or can like, your cat break dance like yeah. it's just we're so complex uh, in terms of our movement system but i think maybe if we if we define physical practice as what you're specifically doing with your physical body um on a daily slash weekly basis mm-hmm. um and maybe we can define the physical practice as you know for for the purposes of this podcast is what are you doing purposely right mm-hmm. what are you implementing purposely in your life And then outside of that, I think you mentioned too, is that the way you set up your environment, like even your work environment, your rest environment at home, the the way you watch TV, all these other things kind of can trickle into your physical practice. But I'd say like, that's how you set up the rest of your environment. So you're not purposely scheduling um, things to do, but maybe you set up your environment so it provides you more movement stimulus um, and different variety of movements uh, when you're doing your your, uh, laptop work or you're watching TV. So I think that maybe we can separate the two of like, you know, what does the rest of your movement hygiene looks like outside Mm -hmm. of your physical practice? And then what is your physical practice? Again, not just the gym, but it might be the hikes you go on on the weekend, the walks you do day to day each morning for certain reasons. Um, so it's the things you implement specifically, specifically to use your body. Yeah. So right. walking to the fax machine twice a day at work doesn't count as your physical practice. No, exactly. Right. But, but that would be a good thing to, 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 let's say walking, you set it up. So you were standing at your desk and you purposely walked uh, yeah. more like up and down the stairs. Like that would be a good component. Um, maybe, you know, the lines can get blurred along the, along the way, but you're right. So maybe setting up your environment is something different than 
what you choose to do for the specific purpose of using your physical body on a daily slash weekly basis. And movement hygiene, I think, was a really good term because so many people seem to be lost in this world of I sit eight hours a day and then I try and jam in high intensity exercise or a run for an hour and they're layering on this this intensive movement on top of a dysfunctional body that's tight from sitting and then you're trying to exert this thing and redline it to get your whatever fitness or exercise in and in the process you're creating a health problem where you get injuries and I think this whole mo background movement hygiene of switching your workplace to from a sitting to a standing centric workplace to a movement um, movement rich workplace where you're moving and adopting different positions allows you to then consume fitness without causing a problem. Mm -hmm. But it's this weird thing where so many people are exercising on top of a sedentary body when they should be doing more movement and they should be paying more attention to what they're doing the other 10 hours of their of their waking day because that ends up being way more important in the end for some people. Exactly. For yeah. a lot of people. So I think what are some of the benefits of having a physical practice I think should be beyond, like you say, getting... Uh, super jacked or super fit. I mean, you're, the physical practice that you have can actually, because a lot, like you said, just back on that point, a lot of people are sitting all day, they're stressed to death, um, they're consumed with technology, and then they go and try to blast out like an hour a day mm -hmm. uh, under high intensity exercise six times a week, five times a week. And it's like, okay, well, I see what you're trying to do here, but, you know, exercise. Yeah, your intentions are good. It's your just intentions the execution are good. sucks. And not only are you potentially to get potentially get injured uh, physically, but you're also adding to this stress cup that is already at the very brim of where it should be, mm -hmm. and you're just trying to blow your system out um, even more. And what often happens is maybe not you, trying to, but they often do that. Well, they they're trying to almost they're trying to go oh, yeah, intense, true. right? They're true, true, they're true. like let's go intense, let's go get it, right? Um, which is good, but you got to realize that exercise and movement. Exercise in, in general, like going hard, is a stress to your body. Mm -hmm. So I think setting up your physical practice, knowing that, you can use things in your physical practice to, to actually help out with that instead of just add to that. And you can incorporate both, both types of things. And not only does your physical practice have an effect on your brain, have an effect on the mental side, but the benefits of a fit, like you can incorporate, there should be an element of, um, of brain work, of, of controlling your mind, of controlling your breath, of controlling your... Uh, your state of your kind of mood, your state of excitement, right? Like mental control, whether that's a cold shower or whether that's going out for a, a 10 minute walk with just breathing nasally and consciously focusing mm -hmm. on your breath the whole time. Like that is, that has insane mental benefits, not just physical. Exactly. That's a, that's one of the biggest things over the past, I'd say two to three years that I've um, incorporated with my physical practice is um, using physicality to improve your mental health. So, so if you, like you said, you go out for the days I go out for a walk outside and I go through a path near my house and I just look around and I walk and I breathe and I try to just, you know, essentially calm my mind. And, and it's, that's meditation. Everyone wants to think of meditation as sitting in a, on a, on a pillow in yeah, a room, like in a monk um, suit. <laughs> exactly. That meditation is just trying to calm and still your mind. Um, and movement is a great way to actually incorporate uh, meditation into your schedule because I find that resonates with me much more than sitting in one place because my mind will start to drift. And again, that's probably something I should work on too. But I think just a component mentally, um, movement and your physical practice can really, really help you mentally. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Like being like running might be your meditation. Yeah. Working on a beam might be your meditation. And I think for me, it's actually been a, a very crucial like escape from uh, if I get into a rut, so if I'm working on something and I can't solve whatever problem I'm trying to do or I'm um, working on the seminar or whatever it is, you get in a rut and you kind of get frustrated. Instead of turning to your to Instagram to, to kind of feed that itch of getting kind of a bit restless or, or defocused, um, instead of taking a pill like Ritalin to make you focused, you can literally go out and completely change your mental state in 10 minutes. Like yesterday, mm -hmm. I went out into the park and I just did some sprints um, and Liv came with me and we just raced against each other for 10 minutes. And that was it. And I came back and I was completely refreshed. I was immediately focused. Uh, my mood was better. And I, it, it just felt like a, it felt like I had just done something different for three hours, but all I did was 10 minutes of intense physical activity just to get me out of that state of mind and put me into a new focused mindset. And I think that's where this whole thing of productivity at work can be enhanced so much more than what it is right now. Mm -hmm. You know, all companies care about is the bottom line. Oh, it costs a thousand dollars to get a standing desk? Well, that's not really, we don't want to spend that. So they find out a way to not spend it and they make you jump through all these hoops of getting a prescription and all this crap. When if they were just explained the benefits and the productivity boost and the focus boost and the 
global happiness with your employment that employees would get in a more movement rich environment that that makes more money movement oh, exactly. makes more money and that's if that's the language you speak is money then people need to take a second look at this because it really makes a massive difference and uh, exactly that like you f- so for the purposes of refocusing your movement practice can be implemented into your into your life and i think that on a broader stamp from a broader standpoint just just the fact that when you when you're moving um it, it just i think your physical practice should make you focus on what you're doing with your body basically the, one of the big overlying themes it should should be to put you in the present with your own body in this mm-hmm. world that, that we have because i think that the big problem people have today is that they're never living in their in the physical world they're so caught up in like the future of the technology matrix. and it's just like thinking about only future 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 past future and it's like you're never actually like oh here's my body here's the world like go outside see stuff like mm-hmm. this is where we're actually living we're not living in this fake reality that a lot of us have created so i think that using physicality to get to anchor yourself to the present moment mm-hmm. on a regular regular basis is is super super key for like say mental health and physical health yeah and so, we're, you know john Roddy said that going he wishes you could put exercise in a pill because it would be like it would be the best antidepressant and the best focusing drug. You combine Ritalin and whatever the leading antidepressant is, you can get those same benefits by going out and doing intense exercise for 20, 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like that's, the science is there to show us that. This isn't like woo-woo or, or guessing bullshit. This is legitimate stuff. And I think, yeah, like so many people, like you said, never ever live in the present. And And the other thing too is like the human form is designed to function optimally with movement and with mm-hmm. struggle. Okay, so we're supposed to be moving way more than what we're moving. We're supposed to walk, uh, what is it, like eight miles a day or something like that is what our genetics are adapted to be doing. Yeah. Um, we're adapted to face struggle, whether that's going out and struggling to find food to feed your family and keep them alive or whatever the case is. You know, I think now we have this unique, we live in this very weird, weird world where if you never want to face struggle, you never have to. Yeah. You don't even have to go out of your house to get groceries anymore. You know, exactly. like, the, like, so it's rewarding, right? And it, it, it is rewarding, but it's, no, but like, it's rewarding to, to do the opposite is, as actually go, go yeah. and struggle, right? A little yeah. bit physically, but it's physically. rewarding after the fact, it's like delayed gratification. You got to yeah. go through the shittiness of feeling like you're about to die with a cardio workout or lifting heavy weights, which is not fun stuff. But afterwards, the reward is immense, even aside from the physical realm. Mm-hmm. So it's just getting people aware that that is of what that can be. And, and here's the act- thing, when you go out and move and your knee gets destroyed and you have back pain for three days after, there's the stimulus or the desire to go out and be physical is very low. So I think, you know, part of this physical practice, all the components that we're gonna talk about after, we need a base of having people be be good, optimal movers. Like you need to yeah. move well first. Move well first, then move often. And if you don't move well and you get pain with movement, that's a big obstacle we gotta come over in order to get people to discover this um, kind of physical practice that we're going to talk about. No, exactly. And I think that, like, like you say, you can use your other parts of your movement practice to help with, um, with, uh, with other things, right? So for instance, I went out on a hike, um, last weekend or the weekend before, sorry. And, um, basically, you know, Luskville falls, right? You're, you're climbing up stuff. You're getting down on hands and knees. You're going uh, up and down rocks. Um, so the two components of that are, Hey, I'm exposing my body to so many different movements. I'm, I'm getting my cardio up. It was combining kind of all of the things in one, right? I'm doing a a bunch of like deep hip, um, mobilizations when I'm stepping up high rocks. Uh, so I'm incorporating strength. Hiking is so underrated in terms of every single step you take is different. You're conscious, especially at Lusville where half the time you're walking on literally a bunch of jagged boulders and you have to be mindful of every single place that you put your foot. That's it. Right. And that's like, that forces you in the present. If you're not in the present, you're going to fall on your face on some jagged rocks. Like there's, there's no choice. So your engineer, you like the feeling of being forced and just smacked into the present yeah. under this very physical state. So all you're doing when you go to Lustville is you're engineering the environment to put you there. And that's important. And, I, and you're doing a big dose of it, right? And yeah. it's not something I can quickly, you know, I can't drive 45 minutes out to the, uh, you know, to the waterfall every day. But it's like something that in, in a, it's a big dose of it. It's like almost a reset. And then right. at the, you know, at the top, you're just looking around and you're like, wait a minute, like I haven't... You know, I haven't checked my phone in mm-hmm. in three hours now. It just feels good. It's like, does that stuff even matter? It, that's the, almost the way it makes you feel for a period of time. You're like, it feels just so much better to to just be connected with your body. It's like, mm-hmm. hmm, what really matters now? But um, that being said, like, I think it, that brings 
itself back with you when you go back to reality. It's just like, ah, it's just like a feeling of ease because you've mm-hmm. combined all of these things, the mental and physical benefits of it. Yeah. So maybe we should, let's dive into what would be an ideal physical practice. Um, and we'll just kind of shoot the shit around that. Mm-hmm. Um, what components should you know, somebody aim for, or do you want to aim for, um, for your physical practice? And even like when someone comes in the clinic and says, I want to work out or I want to train, that's a very broad request, right? Mm. It's like, how do you, how do you take this super wide request and narrow it in to give someone something that's tangible and give them advice on how they can get started, right? And like we talked about before, I think, um, every physical practice to start base of the pyramid should be this optimal movement through functional patterns, right? Can you do a squat? Can you do a lunge? Can you hinge from your hip? Can you do, can you lift something off the floor with optimal spinal mechanics? Mm -hmm. Um, Are your feet functional enough to give you a foundation that can actually support movement, right? So it's, it's checking these essential boxes before we even get into the conversation of how many reps and how many sets you're doing, or even what exercises you're doing. It's okay. Do you have a base of, does your machine work well enough that we can now layer on movement or some sort of um, increased intensity in terms of your physical practice. If you do, then we can talk about the other stuff. And that other stuff is really based on why are you doing this, right? Mm-hmm. Is it to um, look good? Because that's what a lot of people want. It's like, I want to lose weight or I want to look good. I want to look better when I'm naked. Is it uh, to train specifically for a sport? Is it to train just to have a robust body that's not going to break down over a lifetime? And oftentimes, all three of those things are relevant. It's just finding out what someone's priority is. So, so what are your goals first? And I think yeah. that if, if we talked about the real base of the pyramid, it's like you need... I think if you live in 2018, you need to have a mobility practice. So yep. we talk about functional movements and things like that. But well, we, literally, we, we, if your if your joints don't move, yeah. then you can't move like you want to move. So I think that I think just the way society is set up to these days, part of your physical practice should be around maintaining joint mobility and joint mm-hmm. health. Um, Even before we talk about that base of the pyramid, let's talk mm-hmm. about like two other things very quick. Do you sleep eight hours a night? If you don't, start to work towards being able to do that. Mm-hmm. Okay, like. It's such a cop out. Oh, I can't. It's too long. It's like, well, no. Human bodies are designed to function best if they get eight hours of sleep per night. If they don't get that, eventually you're going to have problems. And the mm-hmm. problems that are not going to be directly linked, you know, people being stressed all the time or getting headaches, maybe they don't link that to shitty sleep. But, like, there's a lot of things that go wrong in the body if you do not sleep. Some of those are delayed for 20, 30 years. You only see later in life. But are you sleeping and are you eating food that's me- meant to be eaten by humans? Those are like almost like the pillars that support the whole pyramid. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah. So if we get into components of a physical practice, I think a mobility practice, I agree. It's is essential. Something, it's essential. It's, it's super important. Does your hardware move like your hardware is supposed to? If you don't, you don't have the articular prerequisites to even explore or, or consume movement or fitness. Yeah. Your, your machine needs to actually move like the machine is supposed to. All the parts need to move like they're supposed to. Um, at a baseline level, mm-hmm. right? So there's different levels to this game. Yeah. But it, it, I mean, it's like, hey, if you're if the one thing you like to do is run three times a week, but you don't have enough hip extension and ankle dorsiflexion to express the running pattern, then <laughs> we've a got a, we've got a problem. We got to look at like what is underneath that. So I think prioritizing uh, mobility um, to either offset the other positions that you're in mm-hmm. throughout the day, or achieve positions that you want to attain for other things you do in your physical practice or outside mm-hmm. of your physical practice. Um, is essential and so, your mobility practice can be it can be very broad right it might be yoga might be your mobility practice it might be um weekly sessions like frc style where you're doing intense high threshold mobility work to address specific joints you know but i think mo- the purpose should be to specifically get certain joints yep. moving um that you want to keep moving so mm-hmm. like you say it could be in a variety of like um, you know, things that exist and are prepackaged for you, or it can be your own thing where you, mm-hmm. where you learn the components. There's a lot of information out there. Um, learn what you need to do at a baseline level to just keep things unglued and unstuck and keep the joints moving well. And I think one part that's difficult for a lot of people is, okay, I understand that I need joints that move properly in order to, to then layer on other elements of my physical practice. But how do I know which joints are functional and non-functional? And how do I know, and how can I get guidance on how to restore that mobility? And I think that's where the role of seeing a physical therapist or someone in the movement and health Mm -hmm. world to just objectively look at you and say, these are the joints that are most problematic. This is how to most effectively mobilize those. That's where we have a role. And it's really more of a education and consulting role to just guide people down the right path. 
then the onus is on them to work on it, right? And yeah. even a bigger part is like, okay, your hips are stiff. You don't have hip extension. Here are some great hip mobilizations to restore that hip mobility. But the bigger conversation is changing your environment so that sitting eight hours a day doesn't become this massive obstacle that stops you from ever progressing. Because if you're doing hip mobility work for 30 minutes a day and you're sitting for 10 hours a day or eight hours a day, or whatever it is, it's going to be a losing battle because it's just, it's based on how much time your body's exposed to a position. And that's, it's simple arithmetic, right? Eight hours mm-hmm. versus 30 minutes, eight hours is going to win. So that's, I think our role. And, and the beauty about the education piece is we can do that over podcasts. We can do that over social media, right? Yeah. The actual physical assessment of dialing in which joints are the problem. And, um, you know, that's the part that requires a little bit of, uh, you know, sometimes objectively getting someone to look at you and assess your joints passively. That can be helpful. But, um, yeah, I definitely think mobility, that's like, there's a reason we talk about that first is that that should be the first place you go. Check those boxes. Then you can go on to the next parts. But if you don't do that first, you oftentimes hit a roadblock, whether that roadblock is pain or I can't lift as much weight or I can't run as much volume. A lot of times the body breaks down if you're moving inefficiently. Yeah. Um, so see somebody who can help you with that if that is a problem. Um, and, and again, they can look at your specific movement patterns, your specific level of mobility, mm-hmm. what you specifically want to do with your physical practice and, and kind of tailor things to you so you can get it, you know, the right things out of it. So I, I think once we move beyond mobility, uh, and mobility, that, that part of the practice can be layered in. Um, like I like to layer it in when I'm watching TV at night. I like mm-hmm. to layer it in um, sometimes in the morning to just get my body moving. So you can layer it in in little chunks here and there. And I would argue that you probably each day you should incorporate some form of mobility practice. Yeah, for some people that's 10 body weight squats in the morning, right? And spending a second or two in the bottom of the squat. That's a mobility practice for your hips. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, a really powerful one that I talk to with a lot of patients that are having issues or, or having this stubborn hip mobility. Part of it is they need to stand more and sit less or move more and, and spend less time in static positions. But another big one is like, okay, what do you do every day? And a lot of people are like, oh, I watch some TV at the end of the day, maybe an hour or sometimes two hours of Netflix, some people. It's like, okay, if that time that you typically spend on the couch is replaced with time that you're on the floor in 90 or in a squat or just working, just sitting in any position you want really on the floor because you can't sit with your hip and knees at 90 degrees mm-hmm. when you're on the floor replace the couch with a yoga mat that's a huge change in yeah. your lifestyle so like without ever even having to change how much how much time you spend watching tv or netflix at the end of the day just exactly. incorporate that as your daily movement hygiene to offset the effects of sitting at work until you address the work environment yeah exactly so you can layer it in the key is changing your lifestyle by layering in some of these things So I think if we go from mobility to the next part of it, um, if we talk broad categories, I think from mobility, anytime you're doing anything physical, I think it's a chance to hone in with your movement quality. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we want to like skip the step of like, yes, you should be able to, you should build some movement quality, movement literacy, movement capacity Mm -hmm. um, that you can then rehearse in a... Um, you know, whether it's at the gym, at your home, or whatever well, you think, choose to do. I think that ties into strength, because when we talk about strength, what is yeah. building strength? It's repeatedly doing a movement. Um, maybe initially it's just body weight, but eventually under load to increase the challenge. And I think that's where the movement quality thing ties in tightly. It's prioritize the quality of your movement over the weight of the load or the amount of reps you're doing. And I think one very powerful thing is this discovery of self-limiting exercises where they really don't let you do it in a way that's suboptimal, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you carry two heavy ass weights, when you break optimal posture, optimal positioning, or your shoulders cave in, or your posture goes to shit, you immediately are stopped from carrying those weights if they're heavy enough. And yeah. I think those those self-limiting, you know, bottoms up kettlebell work, hanging um, from a, a chin-up bar, you know, these things are self-limiting where... You know, if, if you ask someone to do deadlifts, they can do five good deadlifts and five really, really shitty deadlifts, but they can still do them, right? When you do loaded carries, like I said, the minute you break optimal positioning, you drop the weights. And mm-hmm. so it's self-limiting. So, so we're talking about strength as one of the categories. Yeah. So I think that, so if we talk about broad categories, assuming you have a baseline level of movement competency, mm-hmm. um, I think strength should be part of your physical practice for, for, sure. for everybody. Um, and it, and it might be more part of, uh, some people's physical practice. If you took, if you look at some sports that require more strength or, um, or power or things like that, or even a sport that is a strength sport, like powerlifting, uh, weightlifting, things like that. I mean, it's going to be a, a bigger component of their physical practice, obviously. Yeah, but getting strong um, is never, but, ever a bad thing. I don't care how old you are, what you do. 
getting a bit stronger just makes life easier and makes yeah. your body more robust and resilient to injury. So that's what I'm saying. Like if you, regardless of what you're doing, strength is, is going to help you as a human being. Um, and there's often things that st- some strength training will go a long way. And people that often don't consider strength training, like I did a running workshop over the weekend. And a big component of that was strength training for runners because a lot mm-hmm. of runners just miss the boat on that. And they're concerned with how much mileage they're doing, um, their, what their cardio is like and all this kind of stuff. But um, the fact that strength basically translates to stability when you're running so strength is like this endless cup like you say for a runner for so many other things that you can just fill up um for the for even the elderly person who's who's traveling picking up a suitcase like putting out their garbage all of, everything starts to become easier when you train for strength and it might just be you know like say once to twice a week uh one to three times a week something like that at a baseline level where you're rehearsing I would say load is the biggest uh, requirement for that. Now, you might even use your body weight for load at first, but just start to load load your body a little bit. See how it responds. Sure. Carry stuff. Squat with some weights. Do some movements with some weights, and it will show you quickly how to organize your body, and it will build some of that, um, that strength. And, um, you know, and, and I, again, hypertrophy is another component of that too because mm-hmm. I think that once you see we start to lose muscle rapidly after a certain age, um, and it takes work to actually maintain that muscle mass over time. Mm-hmm. And I think that for the elderly, like that's a big part of it. We we kind of skip over the hypertrophy work because it's mm-hmm. e- equated to bodybuilding. But I think just having actual physical muscle on you yeah. is is very important. Um, and even for like the metabolic effects that it has. Well, so, even bone density. If you build yeah. muscle, if you're constantly using muscles and they're pulling on bones, those bones are going to continuously remodel and develop stronger uh, architecture. Like you're going to layer on bone by just doing strength training. I think. It's one of those things where people are almost scared of strength training. Like I had a lady in, um, it wasn't recently, but she was in her, I think, mid-70s. And she was told never to, and, and she let, she trained at a gym. And she was like, you know, I've seen people do these deadlifts, but I was told not to do them. And she just kind of went on to the next part of the conversation. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who told you not to do deadlifts? And sure enough, it was a health professional that said, I don't want you, you should never be deadlifting. It's very hard on your back. Mm-hmm. And I immediately had to stop the conversation and address that because that was, it's one of those things like we, you know, I call the deadlift, the health lift. Um, and, and I think it's something that people are scared of because of the name or because they're told not to do it. It's like, then I just asked her, how do you, how do you pick your dog up? How do you pick up a bag of salt or your groceries? You are literally practicing your doing deadlifts or, or the health lift on a regular basis is essentially practicing that movement so that when you have to do it in day to day life, because you're going to have to do it, you're going to have to pick shit up at some point, you're going to have to bend over so that when you do it in day-to-day life, you know how to do it with optimal form. You're practicing the, the movement pattern so that it's easy or you've done it in, with enough reps, with enough mental purpose um, that you know how to do it properly. So I think we need, to, yeah. we need to not be afraid of strength training. And loading, just getting comfortable with loading in different positions. And like load is good. Weights are good. This is all good stuff. Like when you, when you hand a couple kettlebells to a more elderly client in the clinic, it, they often look at you funny as well. It's like, oh my God, you're asking somebody of age 75 to lift this amount? Yeah. And it's like, that doesn't matter. Like, can you, I know you can lift it. Yeah. Like you put exactly. it in their hands and they're like, oh, and then like, oh yeah, I can lift it. Okay, cool. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, that's good for you. That what you just did is good for you. So, so like the lifting stuff, like you say, it just makes you stress and load is what, what strengthens you. Well, I think end. load applied correctly is a, I always think of it as a postural compass. So if you put two heavy ass weights in people's hands, they have no choice but to align their body and stack all the Jenga blocks in a way that's optimal so that that load gets distributed in the right way. Right? Exactly. It's like the analogy I get to people is if, if you live in Africa and you're carrying a vat of water on top of your skull for like 10 miles every day, good luck carrying that with shitty posture at your neck. Your neck's going to snap in half. You have to automatically tuck your chin along your spine so that the load's going in the right position. And Especially if, axial, axial yeah, loading. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, and there's this whole, there's this whole uh, discussion of um, like people, like the pendulum swings back and forth. People are like, oh, you should, you know, there is a component to resilience training where you're loading in positions that aren't uh, optimal and, and things like that. And that's getting more down that road of like the specifics of, of strength training. And there is, there is benefit to that. But I think that, like you say, there is an optimal way to actually axially load your spine. There's an optimal way to lift things. That's the reason why we coach it. Um, so, I mean, know what that is, know what non-optimal is, but maybe get comfortable a little bit doing in, being in non-optimal positions with load, but just know what optimal is. And I, like, people, it's so weird because I think people are going so far in that road. They're like, hey, like, 
Form doesn't matter. Let's do. Let's all just load up Jefferson curls and flex through it. Like okay, okay. I see what you're saying with that, but but I think we should also know what what optimal mechanics are. Yeah. Where you're the most resilient um, and biomechanically sound, so you can actually um, handle these loads, especially if you're doing it repetitively. If all you do is that and you don't know what the other thing is, then yeah. that's not good. It, it's that's, super weird, and that shit confuses people. It's like I think <laughs> yeah. some but the Je- if you see someone talking about the Jefferson curl, it's like okay, stop like. I understand you see yeah. value in this, and I don't disagree with that. But when all you talk about is the Jefferson curl to create like a stir or some controversy, you confuse people where people are like, oh, what about the Jefferson curl? Does that mean you can lift with a rounded back? Well, no, you shouldn't do repeated deadlifts with a back that's arched like a rainbow. I'm not saying you can never go into spine flexion, but I think the conversation needs to be focused on move optimally with good leverage instead of, you know, there, it's not that there's not a place, like you said, but it, it, needs, it shouldn't be the focus of the conversation. And mm-hmm. especially for especially for doing like specific like back to like the topic of strength training, especially if we're specifically training for strength under loads that ideally are getting heavier and heavier, so we build more strength on top of that. Mm-hmm. I think that building strength, um, you know, and you you can apply this resilience training into your your strength training practice, but I think just you know practice good positions as well and put practice practice different positions and just be but the, i think the bigger part of everything is, is learn how to control your body in different positions so whether you are doing a jefferson curl or a deadlift or whatever you choose to be doing have the control and build up gradual resilience and gradual strength so you're not overloading your tissues and, and potentially causing damage or harm so just do it the right way do it for the right reasons and have control over your body when you're doing any given thing and i think just to finish off with strength i think more people need to lift less and carry more why because carries are they're putting you in like just functional positioning building functional stability in both your hips and your shoulders like if for example if we're talking about a loaded carry bilateral like a farmer's walk um they're also way harder to screw up and mm-hmm. they're self-limiting so that's a really good place not enough people i think are showing the carry when they're first starting to um explore strength training and not only is it a really good way to build a base a functional base before you do some of the bigger lifts um but you know it should be an integral part of people's practice like when i started doing carries on a regular basis all of my other lifts felt better and got stronger and carry different stuff too if you look at what like an actual farmer does um there's some of the it like it's it's well known that there's some of the strongest people farmer there strength. are farmer strength so <laughs> like essentially they're they are lifting a lot of stuff but they're also just carrying a lot of shit and a lot of it's like random shit like maybe awkward literally, shit maybe literally literally shit, shit. um they're carrying like you know, bags of stuff, they're carrying pails of stuff, they're carrying mm-hmm. equipment, yeah. um, whatever it is, they're, they're, they're carrying stuff behind them. So about on a farm, that's good strength training. It is good strength training because <laughs> you're just, it's, it shouldn't just be like uni, unidimensional. You can carry a heavy sandbag. That's one of the best things. So, um, okay, so prioritize some strength training and, uh, and that will go a long way. And I think that you want to talk about cardio next. Yeah, let's go to cardio. Let's go to I think, okay, so we covered mobility. You need a base of mobility in order to explore movement. You need, um, the second component we talked about was strength, which is to build a resilient body. And I think working under load is something everyone should explore to varying extents. Um, ideally, starting with self-limiting exercises that have a low uh, capacity to be done poorly. Something like carries, uh, something like even hangs. Like people don't consider hanging from a bar as a strength exercise. I consider it a strength and mobility practice. Because one, gravity is putting you in a position that your shoulders are in pure flexion or getting towards that. And number two, you're literally doing a loaded carry for your entire body weight. You're just doing mm-hmm. it while you're hanging from a bar. So, overhead. you know, self-limiting um, carries or, or static loads and just controlling your body. And, you know, if you carry, if you hold a heavy kettlebell upside down in just a static position um, in the in the kind of bottoms up waiters walk position, you have no choice but to really, really organize and like figure out what the best position is and that's just guiding you towards good positioning, towards a good shoulder position, towards good posture, good core alignment, all that kind of stuff. So um, mobility, strength, and then let's talk about, um, yeah, cardio. So doing a workout to, you know, flex your heart, uh, flex your lungs um, to, you know, we know the brain benefits of doing a, a high intensity um, form of, of cardio exercise is huge mm-hmm. um, from John Raddy's kind of research and science. So, yeah, I think I never used to do... I always thought I just had shit cardio. It's just like what I what I was left with until I realized it was the way I was breathing and how I had zero control over my breath. Mm. Um, and once I got that tuned up, like I have I have a lot more cardio capacity now. And it was just my breath that was li- limiting me. Once you realize your body, your your cardiovascular system, 
specifically your lungs um, and your breathing system is like a mechanical ventilator, then you can start to train that ventilator. And you realize that if the efficiency of how you're breathing, um, how well you're breathing, you, the, the function of your diaphragm and all the muscles responsible for breathing, your, your mobility through your rib cage and thoracic spine, all these things that would either hinder or um, or help out with this mechanical ventilator that we have in our bodies to, mm-hmm. to pump oxygen in, into our uh, into our systems is um, that that starts to go a long way. So it's not just about like you say, it's not just about doing something to get your heart rate up, and that's a big component of it. But it's also how are we breathing during the process? Are we utilizing the efficiency of our of our uh, ventilatory system um, and all of these things combined? So something that gets your breathing breathing up so you're, you're actually having to oh my god um, my heart rate's going i need to actually breathe here but let's get some stuff going through um test that ability you know even if whatever it is for again we can we can't be specific because everyone's individualistic so if you're talking about a, like a runner or somebody in more of a cardiovascular sport then yeah they're going to be prioritizing a bit more of that training um a fighter things like that but i think that some of that goes a long way for for everybody so i think Part of your physical practice should be get your heart rate up, get your cardiovascular system going, work on your breathing efficiency, all that kind of stuff. And that can be in a variety of ways. Like, I mean, strength training can still do that. But I think that, um, you know, getting outside. Um, yeah, get up and down off the floor all the time. Yeah. I guarantee you, you'll be hopping and popping. There's like, many different ways of doing it. But just, yeah, exactly. Just, just stress test that system a little bit. Um, and I think that will go a long way to... Um, I look at cardio as a as a more of a mental exercise than even physical. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes, it has the benefits of making sure that I'm breathing optimally, and that was one reason I realized I got gas with a lot of these things, like with running, for example, because I ran like shit, and so my body wasn't even in a position to be able to breathe optimally. So it wasn't that my my um, circulatory system wasn't bringing enough oxygen to my muscles. That wasn't the limiting factor. It was my lungs intaking enough oxygen and having kind of the capacity on the breathing side. Uh, which was a direct reflection of my positions, right? If I if my body isn't in a good position, I cannot breathe well. If I cannot breathe well, it limits how much of this exercise I can do at a high intensity. So as soon as you improve the position and tune into the breathing, you all of a sudden have this massive untapped cardio reserve that you can now tap into. And like I said, cardio, like for me, cardio sucks. I don't like doing it. It's shit. It doesn't feel good. And that's the whole point. It's doing something that you might not want to do that you know is good for you, Um and facing that struggle and, and, you know, putting your cardio in small doses allows you to have like these micro victories in your daily life, right? Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're like, okay, 15 minutes of running or 15 minutes on the erg is going to suck, but I'm going to do it. And then afterwards, I'm going to feel that I just accomplished something, a, a micro struggle that I didn't want to do, but I did it. And now I feel better both physically and mentally. And that those compound very quickly if you do those regularly. And they feed into giving you confidence to achieve other goals, whether that's changing your diet. If you go out and you sit in a cold tub for three minutes or you go out for a run and gas yourself for 15 minutes and you actually do it and you succeed and it wasn't as bad as you thought, that gives you the confidence to say, okay, you know what? I can't actually stop eating as much sugar. I just did mm. this. Why can't yeah, I yeah. do this? So it really... There's the confidence. And then there's also the physiology of it. You actually literally biologically feel better because of what you've done with your body too yeah so it's like rewarding in that sense it's like brain functions better it's physically rewarding and like you say mentally rewarding so i think that just something to push that system a little bit and stress test it over time is going to be key like the amount of people who who get uh deconditioned when they when they get older walking up a flight of stairs is incredible and that's you know that's a big factor so i mean if you think of these physical practices as in the long term and not the short term it's just another healthy thing to do if you're used to loading yourself um great you're going to be stronger in a year from now but what about if you keep this practice up for uh decades like you're going to be the the 80 year old who can who can have some cardio capacity who can lift some heavy shit up who eventually, and then again, you can link that all the way into like longevity and things like that. So I think this physical practice goes a long way and, and cardio is one, another component of it. Um, let's talk about, so mobility, strength, cardio. Um, let's talk about movement exploration because I think mm-hmm. this is like this kind of new, this is where it gets more specific in terms of the movements that you want to explore, the movements that you want to practice in terms of reflecting maybe the sport that you're training for, for example. And I think movement exploration can also be, um, can be, can almost be incorporated into the other three categories, right? You can do, your movement exploration can have a cardio component. 
your movement exploration can be under load, so it can have a strength component. Your movement exploration can be putting you at the thresholds of your of your joint motion, which is has a mobility component. So this is where, yes, you can combine all the other three into one, but this is where I never used to do this kind of thing, right? This whole movement exploration of just doing a session and putting myself in weird positions to discover where my body breaks down in terms of stability, where it breaks down in terms of joint mobility, um, exploring something that challenges you and puts you into like a very specific mental state like getting on a beam for 10 minutes every day has been one of the best things that I've you know that's the only reason we got into this whole beam thing is because physically and mentally for myself and then for patients that I treated I saw the benefits I saw people connecting to their body and being forced to not think of anything else what they're making for dinner the bill that they have to pay tomorrow it's like the only thing you're thinking of is what you're doing in that moment and I mm. I, I consider the equivalent Maybe not equivalent, but on par with going for a hike at Lustville, for example. But something that you can do that's immediately accessible and you can do in small doses, right? Instead exactly. of driving there and spending a half day to do a hike, you can just have this quick little reset um, or a quick little tune-up for your hip stability or just for your mental state. So, for me, it's slacklining too because you can get out in these different environments and uh, and really you know, just put your balance to the test and, and stability to the test, but slacklining really opened it up as well. This, and I just got into it this year, but I think that using a different environment to kind of explore your movement is, is like fundamental. Um, and well, like on a semi-regular basis, at least. So like mm -hmm. say, if you're, if your environment is dynamic, you're going to have to use your body dynamically. So if you take all of the other things that you're working on in your physical practice, this is where you can actually explore what you're working on. So it's like, oh my God, okay, so my ankles move well and my hips move well. Everything's working well. I'm rehearsing some patterns in the gym. Things are feeling well. I'm building some strength. I've got my cardio on point. Okay, what can I actually do with this body now? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where movement exploration comes into play. It, it's like, what are you doing this all for? Do you want to essentially establish this physical freedom where you can do things that you want to do with your with your body and then the other parts like you say kind of work together and you can kind of use all of these things you've been working on and for some people that might be sports too so Man, it's like physical freedom is a cool term now that i think of it because it is such that okay if you randomly get asked to go water skiing at a cottage if you randomly get asked to play in an ultimate game are you able to participate without being concerned oh you know i got a bad back or i haven't done it i i'm gonna gas out in two minutes it's like just work towards being able to do any activity you want yeah. for the rest of your life indefinitely without breaking down. That's a pretty exactly. damn good goal to motivate you in terms of your physical practice. Exactly. You can use your body for whatever movement you want to do thereafter. Hey, I'm going for a hike. Oh, my knees won't hold up for the hike. Like yeah. You want to be able to do the things with your body. And again, other parts of the training help with that. Um, but like I said, I think for some people that might be also like the sports they play. So for... Instead of just training for the purpose of training, which is which is good, um, now we can explore movement in a dynamic um, game setting. So let's say you're playing football, you're playing hockey, your body's going to be going through a ton of different positions throughout that game um, or practice. And, and again, that's just taking all these skills that you learn outside of things, using your mobility, using your cardio uh, in this dynamic game setting. So I think the bigger picture is like, Train so you can do stuff with your body and not feel, like you say, hesitant, scared, fearful that you're going to break down. So you have physical confidence, physical freedom to be able to explore movement in any given way you want. It really opens up the door for for this enjoyment of life through movement because mm -hmm. movement allows you just to enjoy life. Like that's the big thing. It, if you're if you get movement taken, we all know what happens when you get movement taken away from you. Well, when movement right? is taken away from you, your brain function is taken. Whether people admit it or not, this is a fact. If you move less, your brain doesn't function as well. Mm -hmm. But even just your happiness and enjoyment, like like somebody you know breaks their ankle and they have a cast on, like they're lit, like like you say lit, literally depressed for six weeks as they have that cast on. You take mm -hmm. away somebody's movement, especially somebody who likes moving. It's like oh my god, I feel like you know I feel like shit. I just feel like getting out there. I'm like God. So it just you see it, with runners all the time, they have yeah. knee pain with running. The immediate cop out that gets told to them by their doctor or some health professional is okay. Your knees hurt with running. Don't run. It's like well no, that's a shitty way of looking at it. Maybe we should look at how you're running like like look at it as a problem that has a solution the body is adaptable the body is resilient if it's breaking down somewhere it's because you're you're moving improperly and you're probably doing that with or just applying the wrong volume and yeah. you just need to change how you're moving yeah exactly so we just need to load our bodies right but i think it comes down to in the end physical practice for physical freedom and i think that that makes the connection to yep. like why are we doing this 
and along the way, use these small doses of different things to, again, improve the that hour, that, that next hour, improve that day, improve that week, go on a hike, improve mm-hmm. that, you know, it just, and we can just go, like, go on a, go on a snowboard trip, improve that month. You can use these little things on a micro level for mm-hmm. five minutes, or you can use it on a macro level where you're going on a surf trip for a week um, to just improve your life through that, through that movement. And, and what you do on the side is just to allow you to, to be able to do that. And even the term practice, I used to think of that as, you always hear people, oh, my yoga practice is going great. It's like, it kind of lost a bit of meaning. But then when you actually look at it in, when you look at what physical practice can actually mean beyond just exercise, beyond just workout, beyond just cardio, it's like an encompassment of everything that you're doing with your body, with your body including yeah. your movement hygiene when you're not actually doing movement specific stuff, when you're at work, when you're going for a walk, when you're doing whatever, like move with purpose. And I think, you know, the the components that we covered were, in a good balanced physical practice is a mobility practice, a strength practice, a cardio component, and some sort of movement exploration that puts you in the present or challenges your body. And maybe the movement component, if you are a professional athlete, is to help offset the effects of doing that. You know, if you're a hockey player, you're doing the same hip range of motion exercise repeatedly Mm -hmm. um, in a game where you're a little bit bent forward, so you're in a little bit of hip flex position. Maybe your movement practice or your movement exploration is to help offset the effects of that static position that you're doing at a high, high level. Yeah. Um, maybe it's to work on something like a slack line that changes your mental state, but also improves your hip stability so that you're a stronger, more stable skater. You know, whatever it is, you can, I think that movement exploration part really can be layered in any way you want. It can be an expression of any of the other three categories, but Indeed. it can also be, I surf, I want to be a better surfer. So my movement exploration has to do more with balance. Yeah, um, and it can be literally be things like play, it can be things like dance, it can be many other things where that just gets you moving in ways that you don't usually, because we, we often confine ourselves in our physical practice, Yeah. so even if we think it's a complete physical practice, like somebody gets you trying to rotate or dance, and it's like, oh, I'm, I, I feel like a board right now, so just getting free from these um, sets and reps that we do in the gym, or like you say, or if we're doing a specific sport six days a week, okay, get free from that with other stuff. My favorite thing for moving exploration is to continuously try and find things that I fail and suck at because then it gives you, okay, you know, if, um, you know, this whole fresco ball thing, taking a fresco ball paddle and hitting the ball on the side, on the narrow side of the paddle, I could hardly do it before. Now you can do like 10 in a row. And then once you get good at something, that's almost like a signal to, okay, now I'm going to move on. I've established a, a, a certain degree of competency. I've worked towards that. I sucked at it. And then I got better and better. And now i got to find something new that I suck at. You know, I think that's, that's an important point because if you just pick up different, I think part of that movement exploration, do different stuff mm-hmm. and put your movement system, the the underlying components of your movement system to the test. Because if we if we pick up a different skill that you've never done before, it's like, hmm, how do, how do these neural pathways in my brain organize to, be, to allow me to do this task now? Mm-hmm. So task-oriented... Um, training should be a, a big component of that because then again it's like you're you're or you're literally developing these neural connections in your brain and you're and you're honing in on this tasks that you're being exposed to like you say you 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 might do um you know sets and reps in the gym every day you're getting good at those things but what else are you getting good at so i think there's such huge capacity like i know i speak to a lot of patients that live in these retirement communities and the level at which they're incorporating movement is so is so kind of narrow banded like their mindset there is so narrow it's like oh yeah get up and move or they do like this 20 minute dance once a day it's like those are the people the people that are getting towards you know their older years are the people that should be moving the most that needs to be the most robust movement culture and exactly especially since they're not like especially the retired age people it's like there's you've retired from work okay now you have all this free time in hand what are you doing with it like you should be moving more not less and a lot of them end up just you know watching more tv reading sitting and just for mental function like if you have someone moving and doing novel things whether it's you know it could be walking on me but it could also be just like it could be flying a kite outside it doesn't matter what it is. Just do something different that makes your brain activate in different ways that you've never done before. It can be taking a, a stick and balancing it on your hand and seeing who can balance it for the longest. Like all these little things, these novel um, play activities. Like one of the guys I follow on Instagram, I can't remember. I think it's Jeffrey Barton. Anyway, he runs a gym and it's literally a play center for adults. All he does is make these random task oriented movement challenges and you see him kind of doing them on Instagram and you see all these people doing them and they're the most creative awesome things and they're so novel and random but they're beautiful in that it's a task oriented activity that makes you move your body and think in ways that you're not used to thinking and it's 
it's so cool. And I think that that needs to be brought out to, um, you know, number one, I think just people need to focus on having a more balanced movement practice. It's not, it's not enough, you know, having a healthy body, it's not enough to just work out at the gym once a week. Because like we said, if you're sitting and creating a body with imbalances and then you're redlining your body or five to a limit, week. or, five, to, or like, five times a week. Because that's yeah. what most people do. It's like, I go to the gym every day of the week and it's like, but is that all you're doing? And, and it's like, and what like are you doing at the gym? Literally confined to their same routine that they've been doing for, for two to three years. Yeah. Um, so that's not a, a balanced. So I, I, like you said, I think the, the, a big component of this is balance with all of this. Maybe mm-hmm. take away from this area that you've been you have enough of that it's like you a lot of people have enough of one thing it's like yeah, you what, could you whatever use, you're good at you don't need to do that you anymore. don't need to do that as much right? <laughs> unless it's for your sport um and do this a little bit and oftentimes yeah. it's what you like to take away what you're already doing because you're already getting good at that and add some things that you're not so good at you'll get good at those that will help the other things too yeah so all right let's wrap this thing up so we talk about a movement practice we're not just talking about working out or exercising um we're talking about your movement hygiene during the day in your day-to-day life um, and as a base to this whole pyramid of having a balanced movement practice, are you eating what humans are supposed to be eating? And are you sleeping eight hours a night? From there, you look at components of a, a movement practice. Um, have a mobility element, right? Make sure your joints are moving like your joints are supposed to move. Have a strength practice. Um, start with doing some carries, with doing limited or um, self-limiting exercises that involve more stabilizing through good posture than doing complex lifts. Because the less, the more basic the movements are, the more you can progress your load with a lesser likelihood of screwing them up. Um, Have some sort of cardio component, right? To work on your body both mentally and physically, get your heart working, force you to tune into your breathing efficiency because I think that's a big one. And in the past couple of years, that's been so huge for me in terms of something I never actually used to explore. Um, And then have some sort of movement exploration, right? Do things that you suck at. Discover new movements that you're unstable or not um, not well versed in, um, and, and ha- bring a different meaning to your physical practice in terms of what it actually means, because it, it really is, um, opening the door to understanding these different components allows you to have much better direction and not be as lost when, you know, it's like, okay, I want to work on having a more robust, resilient body that's injured less and is stronger and looks better. Well, here are the elements of what you need to include in that practice and do it regularly, be consistent, um, embrace struggle, and uh, we'll catch you guys next week with another episode of Shop Talk.